to lift up to you this uh, time to open up your word. We ask Holy Spirit that you would give revelation and inspiration, illumination. We trust, Lord, that your word will go forth and it will accomplish that which you please and it will prosper to that which it is sent. I pray, Lord, for every heart to be open and, Lord, that you would touch each one as they need a touch today or they need to be challenged or they need to be encouraged, Lord. Will we just rejoice at the truth of your word. For these things we will give, give thanks in the name of our risen Redeemer. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, Paul, as he wrote this, he said, if there's no resurrection, all of this is uh, moot. It's, uh, we, we're just following another natural religious leader, and we could put a list of those together. It's the Buddha, and it's, the, it's Muhammad, and it's... Uh, other leaders that have come and gone and we can find their tombs and we can say the guy's dead and he's in the tomb. But only in Christianity do we have a, an empty tomb. Only in Christ Christianity do we find one who was raised from the dead. The father raised him from the dead and he's alive forevermore. Now if that's true and if we come to the conclusion that that's true then we have the, uh, God incarnate on our planet. God amongst us. And if that's true, then there's nothing more important in life than knowing Him. You think about that. If, if Jesus is whom He said He was, then there's nothing more important in life than knowing Him. And you know, and there are a lot of folks, they know about Jesus, but they don't know Him. They know about Him. They have a religious construct. Or they have some kind of doctrine. But they really don't know Him. And Paul, when he wrote in, uh, to the... Philippians, and he was in jail at the time, it's a prison epistle, he, and he cried out, and he said, oh, that I might just know him in the power of the resurrection. And that's what she, we should carry with us wherever we go, all oh, that I might know him. And, and life is about him. It's not about me. When you become a Christian, before you become a Christian, life is about you. It's about what I get out of life and what people are giving me or doing to me and what I have or what I don't have. That's what life is. We're consumed with our life and what's transpiring in, in the circumstances around us. And we become sometimes religionists, which means that, you know, we have religion as a part of our life and Jesus is a part of our life and we kind of add them to the package and hopefully to make us a better person. And so people go to church and they hear about Jesus, but they really don't know him. They're not in pursuit of him. They're not passionate about him. So there's, there is a, a void in their life. They don't experience His presence. But if Jesus is truly God incarnate, came to this planet, and He is who He said He is, then there's nothing more important on planet Earth than knowing Him. And the only way we ultimately can know Him is through the Word of God. When we go to the Word of God, He is the Word, and He speaks to us through His Word. And we thank God for that because we only find out about our forgiveness and what's available to us through the Word of God. In sick John 6, 63, it says, and, and, and the, my word is spirit and it's truth. You know, Pilate asked before he went to the cross, he said, what is truth? You know, we live in a culture today where truth is relative. You know, everybody has their own way of looking at truth. There's even a, a movement in the church, it's called the Emergent Church Movement. And it's all throughout the church today, and, and it, it's based upon tolerance, that's the word. And everybody thinks, oh, to you, you have to be tolerant to everybody. But part of that tolerance is simply to say, well, I, I'm not really sure, what I, I believe a certain thing, but you believe something different from me, and we all just, we all have a different truth, and everybody's truth is, is relevant to them. And I uh, heard the, the, the fellow who has the biggest church in, uh, in the world, in uh, America, America, say the other day, well, is there other ways to God? And, and he's a friend of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah Winfrey, I was just watching a little clip of her on her program, and they were talking about religion. And this one gal stood up in her little audience there and said, well, there's, you know, Jesus is the way to, to the Father. And she said, well, no, uh, no, there aren't there other ways, aren't there? Can't you go up another way? And it reminds you of the scripture that says there are others who will try to climb up another way. There are thieves trying to get in. How many know the door is barred? There ain't no getting in without Jesus. Yeah. See, it's intolerant to say that Jesus is the only way. Is that so? Where, if you say that, you're going to be on the outside and be called a bigot or a intolerant or something. 
So the question is, what is truth? Do we have the truth or do we not have the truth? Yes, we do, and it's in God's Word. And it's incumbent upon us to be students of the Word. Paul wrote again to Timothy, he said, Study to show yourself approved a workman for the things of God. To be a, an effective worker. In another place, he said, Don't be entangled in the things of the world. Be, he said, Be a, be a first-rate soldier for God. But there are vast numbers who, who make Jesus a part of their life. And they think, oh, I'm, I have religion in my life. Well, that's your problem. You just got religion. Religion never saved anybody. Without Christ as Lord and Savior, there's no alternative if you leave this life without Him. There's no going to heaven. There's only one way, and that's through faith in Christ. And it's not just an intellectual knowledge. It's not just head knowledge. It's not intellectual assent. It's when we come to accept Him as our Lord and Savior and He no longer becomes an important part of our life. He becomes our life. And when Jesus is at the center of your life and your priorities are in order and it's Jesus is number one, others, people are, you know, it's joy. Joy is Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. There's where you get the joy. And so when we, when we begin to live in that lifestyle, everything changes because we're born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God re regenerates us and we're new in Him. So what has the Lord done for us? And we can look at a few places in your notes. Matthew 20, 28. This is a little bit about salvation. We've got to add that. We've got to make that a, a central part of today's message. Just at the beginning. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, ransom is the same word biblically as propitiation. Most of us know what a ransom is. They, we've seen TV programs. Hopefully never, nobody's ever experienced this. A person is, is taken and is taken away for ransom. And they, uh, you know, you get the ransom note. And you say, if you, if you pay up, you can get your loved one back. And you bring that money to that person, they give you, that's a ransom note. And they've been kidnapped, and you're, you pay the ransom. Well, Jesus came and he paid for your rescue. Because you had been, before knowing the Lord, you were in bondage of the devil. You had been taken captive by the powers of darkness. We know we were born in sin, and then the enemy comes, and he, he rules and, and dominates in our life, puts us in bondage. And the Lord says, I'm going to come, I'm giving my life laid down pouring out of my divine blood will pay the price for every sin of every man, woman, boy and girl on the planet since its existence. Now you think about that. A little trivia, you think about how many people have lived on planet Earth up until this time and we'll have to round it off, alright? The best numbers are this. Right now there are approximately, give or take a few, seven billion people living on planet Earth. And they speculate that there have been 7 billion people who have lived on planet Earth up until this time. So we're talking about 14 billion people. And when Jesus went to that cross, he said, I went to that cross and he gave his life once for all. The God-man came, the sinless man came and poured out his blood. And he said, when I went to that cross, I took your sins with me. When that man, when Jesus, the, the sinless Son of God, has said, He became sin for us, took your sins on that cross. You think of that today. You know, we think of it kind of in impersonal terms, and we oftentimes see representation of Jesus being flogged and His blood uh, being poured out for us. If you've ever gone to the Passion uh, movie, you see, and, and it's horrible, and you look away from it and say, Oh, that's horrible. But the horrible, the thing when He took that cup, he, and he prayed in that garden. He said, oh, this, that this cup could pass for me. Well, we think, well, but dying on the cross was going to be the cup. No, no, that was the easy part. And a lot of people before and after had gone to the cross. It was, and some of the saints of old who were Christians went to the cross uh, with joy in their hearts. So what was that about? Because the God-man, the Son of God, knew that when he went to that cross, he would become the sin of all the world, all those who have ever lived in all the perversions, in all the hatred, in all the heinous acts. He said, I'll take it all upon myself. And he became sin for us. He became sin for you. 
would be difficult for us to write a list of our sins. We can probably mention, remember some of the major ones. Well, we have made some, you know, we've done some things that were totally inappropriate. Where there's been lying and there's been stealing, there's been covetousness. We've taken the name of the Lord. We've, we've not honored our parents. How many qualify at least one of those? We've, we've had an immoral thought in our life. Here's what you were before you were, before, if you're not saved, you're, what you are is called a sinner. And you're sinners. Sinners don't, you know, they, they have a, they, there's a, there's a conflict there. Sin, sin cannot enter into heaven. The only way we get to heaven is when we're pure. And the only way we become pure is when we accept by faith the sacrifice of the Son and His blood cleanses us. He said, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. So in our spirit, we become perfect. Here's the miraculous thing about that. When we get saved, we become perfect in our spirit. And our heart goes to the Lord and we by faith begin to live out righteousness. Righteousness is both, righteousness is both imputed and it's imparted. Imputed righteousness is just a gift. You're perfect. It's imparted in that as we study the Word of God, our life is changed and we begin to live our life righteously. In other words, we begin to live right. Every born-again believer desires to live right for God. Every born-again believer loves the Word of God. Now the enemy comes in his deception and tries to keep us away from it. But Jesus and His Word are one. He said, in the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. He said, I came, when you see me, you see the Father. They said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, you see, you're just looking at Him. He said, every attribute, He said, He was made in the, in the exact uh, representation in, in Hebrews 1. He said, I, I, I'm a carbon copy of the Father. So Jesus came, not only, first he came to save us, but he said, I want you to know what I'm like, what God is like. Before that, it was just a lot of theory. Even through the Jewish, you know, all of the stuff that they went through and all of their, their liturgies and all of their religious practices, they, they never knew him in, in the depth of who he was. Now Moses got pretty close, right? He, Moses, Moses talked to God face to face. But in his full, full, fullness, he said, no, you want to see me? He said, show me your glory. He said, well, that's a little bit too much. He said, well, so we can't, we'll go there. But he said, if I'll pass by you, you can see my, my back parts, whatever that was about. And it caused the glory of God to shine on his face. He said, well, that, that's a big deal. But then, you know, Paul addresses that. He said, well, Paul, Paul had the glory on his face. He said, how much more will you have the glory on your face? And folks who are really connected with God, you see something on their face. You ever been around those folks that are just smiling all the time? They got that silly little grin on their face. And you think it's maybe a, something else than it really is. It's not the joy of the Lord right there. I mean, it's not, we don't have to, have to go around all smiley all the time. But I'm saying there's something about looking at a person who's got, who's, who's got the glory of God on. Good place to say amen. That's a good place. Now here's how I get saved. Look at this. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in your heart. There it is. If you believe in your heart, not your head, if you believe in your heart that God has done this, that He's raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, do we believe that? Or is it to you a theory? See, if you really, really believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, the whole thing changes. Like, that's, that's incredible. It's only one person ever on the planet that did that. Now, the other side of that, if He really didn't do it, and it was a fake, and it was a hoax, then we, Paul says, we're of all people to be pitied. I mean, the whole thing's a joke. It's just try harder, right? It's just, it's just another religious system. And every other religious system is try harder. Try harder. Just keep trying to do, he will give you the list of the, the rules, and you try harder. This thing here is that the Holy Ghost, he said, I'm going to put my life in you. I'm going to write my laws on your heart and you will have such a desire to live according to those principles and precepts. He said, this is, these things are not, he said, my commandments are not grievous. You know who they're grievous to? The unsaved people. You know who they're grievous to? Religionists. 
If you're just a religionist, you got religion in your life, I mean, doing the right thing is a conflict. Because you keep wanting to do the wrong thing. See, once you get saved, I know there's a struggle with the flesh, and we understand that, but you know what? There's a passion to say, I'm going to overcome that thing in the power of the Spirit. Why? For the glory of God. Why? Because we've been our priority. Say, I live for Him. I just get saved for a little bit, and that's the whole, that's the end of the package. A couple weeks ago, I preached a message on draw, draw nigh to God. Salvation is just the doorway to get me into the process. Now what? Now I draw near to God. I just want to know Him. I want to know Him. I want to know Him. What Paul said, that's salvation. Paul said, oh, that I might know Him. And I want to know Him in the power of that resurrection. So I want to know Him. Now we said Jesus got raised from the dead. Guess what? When you get saved, guess what you do? You get what? You get raised from the dead. Because you're dead in your sins. You're in, a, you're in a tomb. You've been entombed. And when you got saved, Jesus said, come out. Just like he did with Lazarus. We talked about that the other night. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out of that grave and he was all bound up in his grave clothes. And that's how we get saved. We're all bound up. He said, now I'm going to deliver you. And he said to the people, now, now loose him. He said, you go out there and help this man. So when you get saved, we're all kind of bound up. But you know what? There's a passion of the desire of the heart. Say, I want to be free. I don't want to stay in that mess. Not only just from, from my well-being, but I want the world to see what the power of God can do in this life. That's what I want. That's my passion. Said, so this is what God can do in this life. And we live for the glory of God. That, that's salvation. He said, for, with the heart man believes. With the heart, everybody say, with the heart man believes now to what? Righteousness. What is that about? Say, when my heart is right with God and I have this, and I pick up that Bible and, and faith connects with it, it says this, I, that will cause me to live right. With the heart man believes unto right living. Now that perfect spirit within me begins to emerge out and my lifestyle changes. My walk changes. What I say changes. How I treat people changes. It all changes. How? When we believe from the heart. And then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You say, what's that about? Do I have to now do what? Well, I, I, one of the things that we, I think is important is that you better go tell somebody. You know, you get saved, you see, you just got saved from your sin and you want to keep it to yourself. You know, that would be weird, right? I mean, I, I know, remember when you got saved, if you were like a lot of people, when you got saved, you wanted to tell everybody about it, right? I just was dead and now I'm alive. It's like getting, you were dead in the tomb, you were, Jesus called you out, you're alive and you want to keep it a secret. That wouldn't make any sense. But here's the other thing, it says, confession is made unto salvation. The word there is, in the Bible, is soteria. Everybody say that. Soteria. All right? That's the word salvation. And here's the meaning of the word soteria. You see it in your notes. It means to have health and safety and deliverance. With the what? With the mouth. Everybody say with the mouth. Confession is made unto health, unto safety, and unto deliverance. Here's what it, here's what it means. Because when I have the word of God, I have now, I have something to say. And rather than confessing and saying things that were in, that were in my heart, that kind of lodged there over my life, and they're bad things, and they're harmful things, and they're critical things, and they're self-deprecating things. And I oftentimes can say it about myself, boy, are you stupid. How many ever said that? Don't raise your hand. Boy, are you a nincompoop, you know. Boy, you can't do anything right. See, that's... That's a confession. He says, when you get this and you get this hooked up right, he said, what you'll do is you start confessing the Word of God concerning your life. With the mouth, confession, when I begin to speak the Word of God, it profoundly, because it's spirit. The Word of God is spirit. The Word of God is spirit. And it's life. And I take the Word of God, which is the Word of Jesus, and I begin to apply it to my life and confess it, and it begins to dramatically change me. I've been around some folks, they say they're saved, and they've been the same for 20 years. They say the same person. It's impossible to be saved and be the same person after 20 years. Somebody say, Amen or oh me. Amen. You can't be the same. It doesn't make any sense. Spirit of God working in you. 
Are you with me this morning? <laughs> Luke 13, 3, we have to add that in there. Part of salvation, an essential part of it is this. Jesus said, nay, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. That means to turn away. from that. That's a life change. You turn away from your old life. You accept Jesus and then you turn away from him and, and, and seek the kingdom. Now, so we have forgiveness. Now, I, I say this. Look at me here. The entire work of God. If you'd say, how could you sum up everything kind of about God and how he relates to humanity? Give me one word. What the whole thing is about. The whole enchilada is about one thing. And that one thing is what? Very good, Jack. That is the prime motivator. God is love. Out of that love, he sent his son to die on that cross that we might be what? Say it, Miss Heidi. Forgiven. forgiven. Everybody say forgiven. forgiven. The whole Bible is about one thing, and that is forgiveness. That's all about. He said the whole love of God, the whole plan of God, everything from, from Genesis to Revelation is about forgiveness. It's all about how Jesus came to forgive us of our sins. And that's why it's got such an issue. We'll not talk much about forgiveness, but when, when somebody harbors resentment or unforgiveness to another person, that in God's sight, that's, that's huge. Huge. That's why I developed several parables on that. And he made this dramatic statement at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and he said, and if you don't forgive others their sin, neither will I forgive you of your sins. And boy, I said, whoa, that's a big one here. Was Jesus just kind of playing around with it there? Just kind of a little word game? Or did he really mean what he said? Well, I'm a saved person who has unforgiveness in their heart. Really. We need to talk. Romans 5. What are we saved from? Real quickly, the wrath of God. God commended this love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his what? By that blood, we shall be saved from wrath. All right? Now, the, look at The wrath of God is going to be poured out on the planet. Many people who have died in their sin are going to experience the wrath of God. Let me tell you something else. Jesus does not want and did not create hell or the lake of fire for human beings. Why? Because he died for everybody, right? So they would be what? For forgiven. He said he took everybody's sin. All they needed to do is accept the Lord. Now we don't have time to go into all the dynamics of that, but it was all about forgiveness. He said, I'm going to send my only begotten. He's going to take, not to die on the cross. That was, ah, every time I look at that, you know, you get cringing. He said, I'm going to make, he's going to become sin, the spotless lamb, the divine nature of God somehow becomes sin. Wow. He said, why? So you'd be saved. He said, but here's the deal. I've given you a free volitional will. After this message today, some of you, maybe all of you are saved, you love Jesus, but here, every time you hear a message on salvation, you get to choose yea or nay. You get to surrender all, or you get to say, no, I'm not. I'm just going to do the religion thing. And you live in this precarious position under the wrath of God, potentially. Now, God's still reaching out to us, right? But he said, ultimately, if you reject me and choose to go the way of the powers of darkness, you will then encounter and experience all that I had for, that, for his enemy. He said, wow, a little fear of the Lord is a good thing, amen? Amen. I mean, that's, that was a, played a big part in my life. When I got, when I got saved, I was... 24, and I'm, I told you, I'd drive across that Route 1 every day going, I used to teach at a, 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 a jail for juvenile boys, juvenile boys from the cities of, of New Jersey. Well, 10 years I was there. And I'd drive back across that, and I got messages, south, you know, I needed to be saved, and I was Lutheran, to, I mean, I was through and through a Lutheran. But I was lost as, the, as you could be. Filled with sin. I come across that road and think, man, if some 18-wheeler goes to sleep, and runs that red light and T-bones me into eternity, I will have no, I will have, I will not have a savior, and, I, and God will look at me and say uh, that you're cast out. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. And I got to thinking about that, and I said, how long is that? That's like forever, that's like eternity, I'm lost forever. And the devil says, oh, oh don't worry about it, because you're just a young guy, 
And when you get old, after you've been sinning your whole life, then somehow you're going to, whoo, now it's time to get saved. Problem with that, you don't know you're going to make it to the older age. You know, I've told more than a few of you, my son died in a car accident with a drunk driver, 24. Who would have thought? How many do you hear that die at young ages? So you live on the edge of eternity hoping that God is going to kind of change the rules for you? It's not. He said, I delivered you from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait on the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your heart, this is before they were saved, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Look at this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. He said every ordinance, every law that you broke and it was against you. And it was, it, it was yours. You owned it. Every audience. He said, I nailed it to the cross. Every sin. The only, way you gotta act, the only way you can activate that. The only way you own that. The only way you get the deliverance. The only way you get delivered from the wrath of God. Is when you from your heart accept Him. Repent of your sins. Believe that He raised Him from the dead. And you say, I'm all in. Say, from this day, I'm all in. I'm not going to be half-baked. Simply because in the Bible said, if you're lukewarm... He said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Who's that? You ever wonder about that? Who's lukewarm people? How many know it's a bad thing to get vomited out of God's mouth? I call it puke warm. Jesus said on that day, many will say, many, many are going to say, oh Lord, Lord, we've done all kind of good works for you. And he makes a little list there. They were, they were religious workers, really good religious workers. He said this, he said, depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, I thought you just had to use Lord. Just say Lord a few times and you're in. And you're total, just totally deceived. He says, when this thing is believed from the heart, when you surrender all, then it's activated. And now everything that in the Bible is yea and amen because I believe. Look at this, Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by the grace we are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, so now this gets even better. I died, and I was raised up, and I'm seated with him in heavenly places. You say, well, how is that? I'm down here, and he's up there, or wherever. He said, this is your ultimate end, that you will rule and reign with Jesus. Already, it's already, in the, it's already in the works. It's already yours. The beginning of that book, it says, all these blessings are ours, and they're all in the heavenly places. These are heavenly blessings, but they're all ours. Romans 6, 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death, and that like as Christ was raised up from the dead... By the glory of the Father, even so, we should walk or live in newness of life. And that is that resurrection life. That is the ultimate end. And the only reasonable expression of a life given over to God. Now we're going to skip over something here because we don't have that time. But this, this, there was so much that I wanted to communicate to you. We'll pick this up last week. And you can read the notes in, uh, uh, under Roman numeral 3. But can we jump over to the glorified body for a moment? I mean, talk about exciting. This is, uh, this is in the future for all of, people, of God's people. All of those who love the Lord are going to receive something called a glorified body. Let's look at Jesus' glorified body. We kind of had a little bit of a preview on that this morning at the, uh, at the sunrise service. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus. And the doors were shut. And then Jesus stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. Say, wait a minute, the doors were shut. 
And there he was. You know, Jesus could not only disappear, but he also obviously could appear. Now, the Bible says we will have a body like his. I said, oh, this is getting a little bit exciting here. You know, you wake up in the morning, you look at yourself, and you say, that ain't much here. You know, you get a little older, you got to work a little harder to make it credible, right? We're talking about that this morning. We think, well, this old body of ours, this is just a, this is just a shell. This is, a, this is just my earth machine, right? I'm just, how many can figure this out? You are not your body any more than when you drive your car around, you're your car. You're not your car. You just ride around in the car and you look out the windows, right? What it is. Well, this is, this is your earth suit, right? This is my earth suit. This gets me around. It can, it can deal with the environment. It's got, you know, muscles and bones and this wonderful thing called skin. You know, that holds the package together, right? It's wonderful. Breathes, got heart, lungs, all that kind of stuff in it. Walk and legs, I can walk around. My earth suit. Guess what? I, this is not me. I happen to be inside of the earth suit and I'm looking out through the windows. The Bible says the eyes are the windows of the, the soul. That's me. I'm a soul and a spirit. My personality, my, my soul is my emotions, my memories and my will and they're all given over to the Lord and they're all brought under, under his uh, blessings, let's put it that way. He said, but I'm just looking out. This is not, I, but what's in my future? What's in your future? You're born again? You're a child of God? He said, this is, this is what's coming. This is just a little picture. After Jesus arose from the dead, he had a glorified body. Now, let me tell you this. The people still recognize you. You know, people have had after-death experiences, and they recognize their relatives. But guess what? You're going to be, you know, Leslie 2.0. Kathy 2.0, whatever it's going to be. It's going to be, whoa, look at that. And I, I thought, I was kidding with her this morning. I won't mention what I said, but look. I said, we're talking about, you know, you're getting old. I said, but you are, you know, back in the day, I'd follow that girl. <laughs> she was, woo, right? And you think physically. I said, but, you know, in heaven, I figure you got all robes on, right? So you're not quite the same deal, but... I said, can I? No, just kidding. I said, where is <laughs> Pat's son? Jesus' name. But I said, look, I, I, this body is going to deteriorate. It goes into the ground. But he said, on that last day, I'm going to raise it up. Amen? Amen? Look at this one, Luke 24. And it came to pass as he sat to have dinner with them, at meat with them. He took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them and their eyes were open and they knew him and he did what? He, he vanished. He said, what? He's there. Poof, he's gone. He's just vanishing. So this is a little picture of what that body is, can, is capable of. Now we see him at the end and he just goes up into the clouds and he's gone. Guess what? That body is going to be your body. It's a glorified body. So you're going to get one of those. If you're one of his. If you don't, you still have a spirit and a soul, and I don't know the body thing, but I do know this, that, you know, in the parable of, no, it's a parable, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man is in hell, and he's in torment, I think, boy, this stuff always got to me, so you're in torment, and you're in torment, he said, uh, Lazarus, you, you had, didn't have much in life, you know, could you just, just one drop of water, one drop? He said, it's a brief, there's a, there's a barrier, I can't, we can't cross over. He said, well, so, send somebody back from the dead to, to tell them and to warn them. Well, he said, Some, send Moses. He said, if someone came back from the dead, they still won't believe. And it was true. Jesus came back and many still did not believe in him, even though he was raised and he showed himself alive to like 500 people. We're going to look at that. I'm, I labor this with this. For I delivered unto you, 1 Corinthians 15, of all that I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Look at this. And He was seen of Cephas, which is Peter. Then He was seen of the twelve. And after that He was seen above all the five hundred brethren all at one time, of whom the greater part remained. Verse 7. And after that He was seen of James, then all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of time. 
Why do I believe that Jesus is raised from the dead? Because they saw him. This is an historical account. It's just not a nice little story. And they have the manuscripts from the very early days to substantiate that. They saw him. They touched him. They handled him, John writes it. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 42, it picks it up again and it says this. This is about you and about me. So also is the resurrection of the dead. That day in the future, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. That's speaking about the contrast between our human body as it is now. How many, how many are experiencing some of the weaknesses of this body? All right? And, and day by day, over the years, it becomes a little weaker every time. He said it's sown in weakness. You are born in weakness. As a little baby, we're not born in strength. We have to be cared for that little tiny child. And even younger boys and girls need to be cared for. They're dependent because there's a, a, a need that they have in their life. And then we get older and we're, 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 we're sown in weakness. He said, but you're going to be raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Notice the contrast. This is a natural body. Jesus had a spiritual glorified body as we will. And it is also written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth and earthy. That's representing Adam. We are, have the body of the Adamic man. It's earth, of the earth and earthy. But the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. And as we have been born the image of the we have born the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now there it is. Now there's, there's the contrast. He said, in, uh, we've borne this, we've labored with this, we've, we've carried this body around, or the body has carried us around. He said, this is the natural body, but you're going to get a spiritual one if you're born again. He said, hang on, it's coming. You know, right now you think, oh, you parse the whole thing out and say, oh, all this Jesus stuff and serving the Lord, I don't know if it's all worth it. Oh, 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 boy. You know, first of all, it's worth it in every level. Because it'll absolutely dramatically change your life here. You get saved, healed, delivered. You get filled with the joy of the Lord, the peace of God. You have peace that passes understanding. And you, you think, well, I don't know if I want to go there. Well, it's all available. He said, but the big payoff is on that day, whether, it's, whether we are raptured off of this planet or we go by the way of the grave. He said, this natural, this earthy is going to, I'm going to put on a spiritual man. I'm going to put on that glorified body one day. And you think about it, live with Jesus forever and ever, all throughout eternity, experiencing the wonder of his kingdom that is everlasting. Every once in a while I watch these shows on, a show on television about the earth, how the earth is made, and this universe and all that stuff. You want to see or hear some heresy, a lot, I mean lunatics out there coming up with stuff. I gave a little bit about that a little while ago. But anyway, I was, this, this physicist was there the other day, this lady, and she said they found out that somehow, some way, things are moving away from us. That when God spoke the word of creation, it's still being created. We think, oh, he created once and, it, and he spoke and that was, you know, it was finite. It's not finite. You think, well, what am I going to do for all eternity? Well, let me tell you something. That glorified body can move to places and do things that you cannot even begin with the best science fiction movie you can watch. You can't figure it out. You don't know all that's up there. He said, I, he's got something planned for us that's going to be absolutely, incredibly spectacular. And some folks would say this, well, I want to live my sinful life down here for my few, whatever years it is. Oh, really? So you're going to... You're going to sacrifice eternity in a glorified body in the presence of the living God forever and ever for a few short years here. It's like beep and time, beep. not even a blip, you can't even say it, for your, few, for your sin life that's going down the road of destruction anyway. You think of how deceived people can be? Why won't you accept the Lord, sir? 
Why will you not bow your knee and accept the Lord, ma'am? Ask somebody that. Think about it yourself. Why won't you do that? You know why? Because it's that Adamic nature. It's the rebellion of the heart that says this. I, I will be God of my life. I will not submit to that guy. You know why? Because you don't believe he got raised from the dead. You think it's a fairy tale. Because if you really believed it, transform your life. You'd, you'd, bat, you'd fall on the ground right there. Say, so the God man has come. He said, I'm, I'm going to take a few years of sin and I'm going to sacrifice eternity? Really? Talk about the depth of, de of deception. It's incredible. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We have, when you come to Christ, not only have you died with Him, and been baptized into His death, but you have been raised with Him. And you will be seated with Him and be a co-regent of the kingdom that He has established forever and ever. That's the Easter message. What's it all about? One word, the Easter message about this. Forgiveness. You can be made pure and forgiven and ready for heaven. Only righteous men will enter into the, to heaven. And he's not talking about your outward man. You say, well, I have done some things that are not right. No, he's not talking. He's talking about your spirit man. He said, this spirit man, when I die, I am perfect right here. Why? Because I, be I, I belong to the Lord. And I am, by faith, I am being perfected in righteousness. Born again people do not plan to sin. We don't plan it. We may f have an occasion to sin. We should not sin. That's the 1 John 2 1. We should not sin, but if we do, we have an advocate with the Father. But when we're planning to sin, we've got to really, really look deep what we got inside. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. All right, let's all stand. Now, if you, look, if you're, not, if you're not saved today and if you can't get saved with this message, whoo, blow, you, you're going to have a tough time down the road. What a day to be saved. Dan, put on something nice. Put on, put on that hallelujah one that we have this morning, all right? That's a beautiful song. Oh, hallelujah. You know, that's, that, is, that word, hallelujah, is a, an internationally understood word, that one word. You go to, it doesn't matter if you're in Haiti or you're in the deepest parts of Africa or in Asian countries, they all know hallelujah. The hallel, Yah is God. Yah, Yahweh, hallelujah. We worship Him. Lord, I pray for each one that came today, Lord, that you would uh, cause these words to just go deep within their spirit, Lord. Now, if they're saved today, that they would have a greater passion to serve you. And Lord, to live in a way that would bring you honor. And Lord, Lord, that they would walk in the power of the resurrection. Show us, Lord. Impart to us, Lord, greater power to live a life that honors you. Young and old. And Lord, if there's even one in this place that is not saved today, Lord. May they understand the difference between religion and biblical relationship, true Christianity, genuine Christianity. And not buy into the mental ascent of just knowing about Jesus. And I pray, Lord, you'd draw them and not one would be lost. And you'd accomplish that which you please through your word and you'd prosper into the word that has been sent today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, from the very first time we opened our eyes this day that we had the opportunity to come and praise you.
in our service early this morning, Lord, when we learn about the men on the road to Emmaus, to our time and breakfast together sharing our lives, to our study, Lord, today of open doors and how to reach others, and then to this message just simply about the resurrection and all that it promises, all that it means to us, that we are forgiven through the blood of the Lamb, through that incredible one-time sacrifice, now over 2,000 years ago. Bless each and every one, Lord, in a glorious way. In Jesus' name, amen.